Hi everyone, good morning. Thank you for coming to uh, these four short courses and uh, I hope you will enjoy them, you will learn. And uh, so this is a great way to, as Michel said, kick off our workshop on exoplanet imaging science. So this morning, uh, this is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Stebelfeld. Uh, Carl is the chief scientist of the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program at JPL. His research interests include protoplanetary disks and debris disks, high contrast imaging, exoplanets and star formation. So Carl earned his bachelor degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering and engineering physics from Princeton University and a PhD in astrophysics from Caltech. Uh, Carl started at JPL in 1993. He worked on the Hubble with Peak 2 uh, science and, and he was part of the science team. In 1999, he moved to the Spitzer Space Telescope Project Science Office. From 2002 to 2006, he was the study scientist of uh, the terrestrial telescope, uh, TPFC. And from um, 2011 to 2016, he moved to the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, where he was the chief of their exoplanet and stellar astrophysics laboratory. Carl returned to JPL earlier this year uh, to take uh, his position as the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program Chief Scientist. And so, Carl, please, and we are all looking forward to hearing about uh, the overview of exoplanet direct imaging science from, from your point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Well, I'm very glad to be here as a Caltech alum, as a returning JPLer. Um, and I, I really see this kind of uh, event as uh, something that's going to be beneficial broadly, including to the Exoplanet Exploration Program as we develop you know, new strategies for being better at high contrast imaging through the discussions this week and, and the other things that I hope come out of the meeting. So I'm enthusiastic for the week. I'm going to give you now an overview of exoplanet direct imaging science. I was asked to give it at the 101 level. I can see several people in the audience who were at the 501 level. So you may not be too excited by what you're seeing, but we'll see uh, how you take it. Uh, and so I think I'm just gonna get started. So the way I'm gonna approach this is to try to tell you my view of what was important in history uh, over the past 30 years or so in getting us to the point of having exoplanet images that we're enjoying today. Uh, especially the period starting in about 2008 where we really started to have the um, detections roll in. And then because the exoplanet program uh, thinks ahead for NASA for large missions, I'm going to talk to you a good bit about the requirements for imaging planets and reflected light, including that crucial problem of habitable planets that the 2010 decadal survey uh, thought was a priority for future investments and hopefully will be something that the 2020 decadal survey decides to go big in. So let's start out on what's an exoplanet. More, it's more basic than that. Uh, a planet orbiting a star that is not our sun, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Um, and according to them, it's also first used in the year 1996, so it is definitely a recent term. Even through years of science fiction and philosophy and so forth, I don't know that anybody was using this term uh, earlier than 1996. And of course, there, there was a lot of imagination about what exoplanets uh, would be, how many would be out there, lava planets, ice planets, um, planets that are all oceans in a bad Kevin Costner movie. Uh, so uh, we, we've had lots of imagination, but science is in a position to look for them uh, in many different ways. And so now, as I said earlier, they have come into view during the past 30 years. So that was a process that, in my view anyway, uh, started here with a project that JPL was doing and that was uh, uh, led to the creation of the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, and that is the IRAS All-Sky Survey and Mid-Infrared and Far-Infrared Wavelengths that took place back in 1983. Now, you're going to see a conti continuing theme here that uh, we are doing things on exoplanets with a general purpose telescope that really wasn't designed specifically for the exoplanet application, but nevertheless it does lead uh, to important insights. Uh, it was an all-sky survey, not really targeting any one particular object at a time, uh, and it had four bands, and the main discovery re relevant to exoplanets of the mission was that there were stars out there um, that had infrared signals well in excess of what they should have been if there was a bare stellar photosphere alone, especially out here starting at 70 and 100 microns. There were lots of stars earlier type, higher luminosity stars 
that showed this excess. There was, of course, the state where Vega was observed early on in the calibration uh, target, and it proved to not be a good calibrator at all because of this excess. So um, nearby stars were prominent uh, having um, this infrared excess, and Brad Smith and Rich Terrell went to a telescope in Chile in 1984. They were interested in moons around planets, so they had a coronagraph. They put poted it at several of these stars, and Beta Pictoris turned out to have this disk-like cloud seen nearly edge-on. And this is basically the first uh, direct imaging evidence of another planetary system. Uh, later work found that these dust clouds had to be created by collisions between parent bodies and constantly replenished, because the small particles in the disks would blow away uh, if given uh, enough time over tens of thousands of years. And so they required parent body belts, like our asteroid belt or like our Kuiper belt, in order for this structure to persist. Um, the mass of material in these disks is very small, less than a few lunar masses, so this is not a stage of planet formation, except perhaps of large rocky planets. The gas is basically gone, so if there are Jovian planets, and we know there is one, uh, they've already formed. And of course, this was the discovery of a Kuiper belt around another star before we even knew that our own solar system had a Kuiper belt. That didn't come until 1992. Um, and if you were in grad school, like myself, in the early uh, 90s and uh, late 80s, and you wanted to work on extrasolar planets, this was the biggest thing going. Um, so from looking for disks around stars with infrared excess, uh, there were long predicted to be brown dwarf companion, brown dwarf objects that would be um, stellar, um, substellar objects that were not massive enough to sustain nuclear fusion in their cores. And people would look for these faint uh, objects near M stars, late type stars of low luminosity, because there would be the easiest contrast challenge. So this is the discovery image that uh, uh, Tadashi Nakajima and David Golomowski obtained, also here involving Caltech at the Palomar 60 inch. Uh, they didn't have a really good uh, adaptive optic system. It was just seeing limited. The companion was just barely seen over there. You can see a little bit better in the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and this is a nearby star at six parsecs, a 36 AU separation companion. And this sort of kicked off the, the search for companions in a big way after this discovery. Uh, now, today, there are dozens of brown dwarf companions that are known from surveying a lot of objects, and there are hundreds of field brown dwarfs that were found from the two-mass survey, uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and the distinguishing feature of these objects that links them to planets is the spectrum. So we, we're showing here uh, four different spectra uh, of, of the sun here at the top uh, going across the near-infrared wave bands. Then here is a late type M star near the end of what we thought was a st uh, the, the stellar sequence at the uh, pre-2 mass era. Here's the spectrum of GL229b, uh, the, the brown dwarf companion that I just showed you. And here's the spectrum of Jupiter at the bottom. And of course, the thing to notice is that there's a huge similarity between Jupiter's spectrum and the brown dwarf spectrum. Nothing at all like even a late type star or of course the sun. And the key distinguishing feature is the presence of methane. Jupiter is a 120 Kelvin uh, effective temperature object. Uh, GL229b is more like 900 Kelvin. But nevertheless, they share these deep absorptions from methane, and especially here at the 1.6 micron cutoff. So there was nothing else in the sky that had methane in it other than our giant planets until this discovery took place. And that kicked off a lot of interest in doing surveys uh, for companions that were methane dominated like this, and that went forward through the 1990s and into the early 2000s. So an important feature of the brown dwarfs is their luminosity evolution. This is a set of tracks from Adam Burroughs, 1997. Uh, it shows the effective temperature of a brown dwarf as a function of its age. And so it has, is born with a lot of heat of formation, gravitational contraction. Uh, and if it's massive enough, 211 Jupiter masses is roughly 0.2 solar masses, then it comes down to the main sequence to an equilibrium luminosity over here, equilibrium temperature. But if the mass is not sufficiently large, then the luminosity plateau never happens, and it just continues to cool down into oblivion. Uh, and then there's a special extra feature that happens at 13 Jupiter masses or so, where above this, there is a little bit of a plateau caused by the burning of deuterium, uh, a residual form of hydrogen that came in with the uh, planet forming gas. But then after the deuterium is used up, it then still decays down away into um, uh, cold and oblivion. 
And notice that each of one of these curves is for a different mass of planet. So this is showing that uh, a brown dwarf will cool, uh, a planet will cool, and let's say you find an object that's 1,500 degrees Kelvin, would be across on this line. So you've got to know how old it is in order to interpret what its mass would be. So if it's very young, it might he just be a few Jupiter masses uh, on this side of the diagram. But if it's older, it could be above this limit of deuterium burning, which is considered to be the, the boundary between planets and brown dwarfs. And so it could be out here uh, being masses of you know, 20 or 30 Jupiter masses. Uh, and if you go out this far, it could be all the way up nearly to the hydrogen burning limit. Uh, so um, we've, this put the, a premium on two things. One is we really want to know the ages of the stars that host brown dwarfs. And second, if you want to find more of these methanated companions, the way to do it is to find samples of young stars and look very hard at those for uh, companions in direct imaging. So um, the, the samples that you would look at are the most recently formed stars. These are Titari stars in constellations like Taurus, Ophiuchus, and Chameleon, but those happen to be 120 parsecs away, so they're not uh, easy to resolve and look in close. Uh, but Beta Pictoris, that original disk uh, discovery image that I showed you from 1984, that turns out, after years of work, to be only 20 million years old and much closer, 20 parsecs away. So it was gradually realized in the late 1990s, after the, the ROSAT satellite surveyed the sky in X-rays, we were able to see where the uh, chromospherically active stars were. Um, and we noticed, uh, many workers noticed that these stars were part of moving groups. They had common proper motions and, and space velocities, indicating that they formed in a young cluster, but very loose cluster that was in the process of dissipating and, and distributing into the galactic disk. Um, and so you can catch some of these, these moving groups, um, and then make um, imaging searches for companions, and we're still doing that today every time we get another improvement in contrast capability. In the early days, these search programs were keying on methane, because that's what we saw in G, uh, GL229b. It's later proven that that wasn't such a great strategy, uh, as you'll see. And then whenever a target is found, a companion is found, there's always a debate about whether it's a planet or a brown dwarf because the age isn't exactly known. Uh, and so it also depends on the cooling models. So you can't feel satisfied as a dynamicist that you know the mass of these planets um, uh, when they're actually detected. It's always going to be subject to revision. So possibly this would be the first image of an exoplanet made with a VLT in the near infrared. Uh, it's in a star in a moving group, in this case the TW Hydra Association. And it's around a brown dwarf. The primary object is itself a brown dwarf. Uh, and the companion object, 55 AU away, is substantially fainter. The companionship, as always in these cases, is verified by measuring the, the image separation uh, multiple times and seeing that the companion shares the proper motion of its host star. And here, the companion from the evolutionary track models comes out to six Jupiter masses. So this pretty much um, makes the case for being an exoplanet but it's not around a regular main sequence star. So if that's what you want for it to be a real planet, um, this is a halfway. So imaging is finding these, these companions around uh, young moving group stars, um, especially ones that are, are dusty and young. But at the same time as imaging is making progress here, there are other methods of, of planet detection. Now I'm just going to remind you of, and this is, of course, completely known to many of you, so the radial velocity technique um, measures the disturbance of the host star due to the gravity of the planet as it moves around its orbit. And so 51 Pegasus, uh, just as you know from the 20th anniversary last year, was the first one of these found around a sun-like star in 1995. Uh, that, this was a very large amplitude, very close in, hot Jupiter, surprised the heck out of everybody. We would later be surprised in imaging about things that were in a parameter space we hadn't expected either. Uh, as always in radial velocity, you can only see the projected component of the velocity along the line of sight. So there's always a sine i ambiguity. The mass you get is sort of a lower limit. Um, and by the time we got to 2005, a couple hundred of these things were known. And this was especially interesting because some of them were around nearby stars that were young and accessible to imaging. So I can recall you know, trying to see the Epsilon Eridani planet at uh, Palomar. I bet you many of you can recall trying to see the Epsilon Eridani planet around some uh, instrument that you were using. 
Um, and these RV planets tend to be Jupiters mostly uh, in terms of their uh, mass determination, subject to the ambiguity, and some of them are uh, Neptune mass planets. So the good thing about radial velocity for imaging, which is our purpose here, is that it does produce targets that imaging searches can go and follow up. Uh, and so and originally, of course, um, these things are, are pretty faint. So when you go and look at a radial velocity planet system, it's because you're interested in seeing another planet that may be more massive that hasn't shown up yet in the RV signal. And so some folks like Justin here have spent a lot of time looking for um, uh, planets that are producing radial velocity trends, and of course they turn out to be stars sometimes. But we can thank the radial velocity folks for giving us a target list to aspire to in our future um, space missions. So transit, uh, ba very basic here as you know, um, when the planet is able to uh, be aligned with the, the star, almost equatorial orbit, it passes in front of the star and it disappears behind the star. And you can measure the size of the planet from the uh, size of the drops and the brightness of each uh, as they go around. Uh, you can actually measure the temperature if it's hot enough to uh, uh, go into occultation. Uh, while this is a fantastic and productive technique, it doesn't help us in imaging very much because pretty much all of the transiting planets, uh, they're found in short period orbits and we can't look in that close, you know, inside of an AU generally to be able to um, get those planets uh, accessed with imaging. So transits are actually accessed with spectroscopy and a totally different technique. But th this shows, for example, um, a, a transiting planet passing in front of the star. Then there's a very faint um, transit here as the planet goes behind the star and the planet's light disappears. And then it repeats periodically. If you zoom in on this signal, uh, on this middle panel, you can then see a little better the secondary eclipse where the planet goes behind the star. Um, and so that is actually, um, if you, unless you want to count the uh, brown dwarf planet that I showed you earlier, that is really the detection of photons from a planet um, that was made by the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, in 2005 in two targets. So the, uh, Spitzer beat us imagers uh, unless you like the, the brown dwarf planet. So lastly, in terms of reviewing the other um, different techniques, microlensing started getting detections in 2004. And of course, the technique depends on there being a, a planetary system in the, in the foreground and some background object that you generally aren't interested in at all, except it's a flashlight. And as that uh, foreground planetary system moves across the line of sight, it uh, can magnify and distort the image of the background star and amplify it. And you get these light curves of the star passing in front of the other star and extra little blips from the presence of a planet during the, the, uh, the, the event of passing in front. So um, this is becoming a more productive technique. It's going to be great for W first. But again, on imaging, it doesn't help us with targets because these planets are very far away. They're halfway across the galaxy. Uh, and we can't possibly resolve them with any near-term technique. Uh, and in fact, they're very frustrating because you can't follow them up really in any way at all once the lensing event has taken place. Um, there's really not much more to do except model it. Um, so we really got to feel we were making progress in the late 2000s. Uh, Beta Pictoris disk had been out there for a long time, imaged and studied. Uh, and then uh, Anne-Marie Lagrange in data that was taken a few years earlier but was only processed well uh, by 2009 found an object right in the disk plane uh, and then waiting patiently for a year saw it move to the other side of the star and now this has been uh, tracked very well, uh, the orbit, by including some people in this room. Uh, and so the planet is orbiting around nine astronomical units. Its uh, mass is um, somewhere up around eight Jupiter masses, if I remember correctly. And so this is a, just an outstanding success in terms of showing that a young star has a luminous planet uh, and a very bright disk that's uh, still in the process of clearing. Um, now the spectra of these imaged planets is of great interest. So if you look at Beta Pictoris B, the spectrum here in H-band from GPI, uh, Jeff Chilcote's work, uh, shows that the planet is extremely hot, 1650K as the earlier uh, measurements did. But the spectrum here shows that uh, we're not seeing uh, the um, presence of methane strongly on the shoulder on the right-hand side of this hump, like would be expected. Uh, and so this is a feature now of all the um, um, planets that are hot like this is that we just don't see the, the methane uh, feature at all. 1200K is normally the boundary where you expect to see methane come in for a T-dwarf. Uh, so this is uh, hotter than you expect for that. 
Uh, and so uh, the methane's absence is also due to the, the fact that the atmosphere is dusty as well as to the high temperature. Uh, so this is allowing us to interpret the uh, abundances in the atmosphere, uh, especially in conjunction with other uh, higher resolution spectroscopy. So th of course the, the really standout system uh, for exoplanet direct imaging uh, over the past um, 10 years has been HR 8799, which I think lots of you who work on the system know it like the back of your hand. Here's the images taken by Christian Marois in two different bands and a colored composite showing these four um, massive uh, planets that are hot, a 40 million year old star, uh, all about eight Jupiter masses or more, but depending on the evolutionary models as to whether that's really the right mass. Um, and now the orbits of these have started to be tracked pretty well. So we're getting a, an idea of, of how coplanar they are. It's almost a face-on system. Uh, and these planets are like Beta Pictoris in a system that has a debris disk. Now we can't see that debris disk in scattered light at high resolution. It has been seen in low resolution with Alma uh, and, and even lower resolution with Spitzer and Herschel. Um, but the interesting feature after you subtract away the stellar spectrum is that the resulting um, infrared excess here in the mid-infrared with Spitzer IRS and then at, at the 17 microns and longer wavelengths, uh, it shows that there's a two um, components of dust in the system are needed to fit this excess. This is a simple model with two black body components. Uh, and so one of them is in close, around 150 Kelvin. The other one is much further out, around 95 AU, 45 Kelvin. These distances require some assumptions about the grain properties. Um, but the nice thing about this picture is that uh, we published this in 2009 after the 2008 detection of the first three planets, but the fourth planet wasn't found until 2010. Um, and so when it was discovered, thank goodness, it was at 15 AU and wasn't sitting where we said the disk would be because, of course, the planet would chew up the disk and it wouldn't be there. So we have this very nice picture of an inner disk, an outer disk, and these four giant planets, I mean, much more massive than our Jupiter, uh, very hot, but they're nestled in between these two disks just the way in our solar system the, the asteroid belt and its dust is interior to Jupiter, and the Kuiper belt and the dust that we assume is there is out past Neptune. So you could almost think of this naively as Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, four planets in the same um, gap in the system. So we've found through Spitzer studies, um, there are many other debris disks that have two belts in their spectral energy distribution structure, just like HR 8799. So these are natural targets for further imaging planet searches. And so some of us in the audience are working on that with uh, um, the um, Keck folks, Farisa Morales is working on that. Then there's VLT observations that are happening to do this too. Um, but it, we are, it's hard to find a system that has got as young as this and it's got as massive a number of planets as this. All right, so now spectroscopy of these planets is something that has um, been a, a very strong effort. And this is a paper from 2015 that Travis Barman and Quinn Konopaki uh, went and did. And so here what they're doing is they've observed using the Keck integral field spectrograph, OSIRIS, they've um, m measured imaging spectra of the outermost of the four planets, HR 8799b. The outermost one is farthest away from the glare of the star, so it's easier to get a clean spectrum. This week, I hope we're talking about how to clean up our spectrum much closer in, uh, which is a, remains a challenge. Um, and so here's the um, spectrum of this outermost planet uh, from 1.5 to 1.8 microns and also at two microns. And so um, the technique that they used that, that Quinn first did in 2013 is to correlate uh, the spectrum of a, a molecule of interest at the temperatures that you think are appropriate for the atmosphere here correlate this with that and see how strong a cross correlation you get. Uh, and so if you see a peak around zero velocity, that means that, uh, that this species you were checking for is um, significantly present in the spectrum. And this gives you the advantage of, instead of trying to find just one absorption line to see the planet is there, you can use all the different molecular bands that are present at all these wavelengths. You can use the signal from them. Uh, and so that lets you pull out a much fainter uh, level of, of presence of that material. So here uh, in planet B, at, at this wavelength range, water is indicated, uh, and really the methane doesn't have much of a peak there, maybe a very weak one, because that's consistent with a lack of methane uh, in the Beta Pictoris B planet. But this paper also shows the same analysis being done in the two micron region, 
Um, and, and so in this region, um, carbon monoxide is showing up pretty well at this little, little jump here. Uh, and then methane uh, seems maybe to be showing up. This is being shown here on the, on the orange. It's a more significant peak than it is there. And then I'm not quite sure how this, the CO is, um, I guess that's significant, but it's oscillating around a lot. Uh, so this is the um, you know, best opportunity to dig out the composition of these planets is this correlation method. All right, so then the third of the planets that came up back in um, 2008, 2009 was the, the Fomalhaut B object. Now, this is the original HST discovery image. Fomalhaut is a um, bright nearby star that has a dust ring around it. It's appearing elliptical mostly because it's inclined, but it's also um, slightly offset from the center of the disk is offset from the star because of an intrinsic eccentricity of the dust ring. In order to make that eccentricity and maintain it, theory says you need a perturbing planet close to the ring inner edge. And so when this popped up, um, the team that I was on, we concluded, hooray, we found the object that is causing the disk to be eccentric and sculpt the inner edge. But more data shows the situation is not uh, as straightforward as that that Paul Callis analyzed the same system again in 2013 uh, using additional HST data and deprojected the orbit, um, the best fit orbit, uh, there's a wide range of orbits allowed, but this is sort of the median uh, best fit orbit. And the planet next to the ring is actually on an orbit that has to be going out and crossing it. And that's not what should be happening if the, the planet was sculpting the ring, it should be just tracking the inner edge with the same eccentricity that the ring has. So um, this is not the perturber uh, that's creating the ring. It's some kind of object from the outer belt, uh, an interloper that crosses it. In my mind, this has always been analogous to the way that Pluto crosses Neptune's orbit, that Neptune actually controls the dynamical state of Pluto, uh, and, and they never get a chance to collide with each other. So I'm kind of uh, always like the idea that the planet that we can't see that's sculpting the ring is dynamically controlling um, the um, eccentric object here that would be the analogy to Pluto. Uh, but this shows that you can't really interpret what you're seeing in terms of disk interactions unless you've got the orbits figured out. So another really weird thing about this object is it's just ridiculously bright. It, it's um, so bright that it has to be reflecting the light of the star with something 10 Jupiter radii, which theory says you could never have something that big. So the, the interpretation has always been that there's a lot of dust around this object. And because I was on the original paper, I'll always defend the possibility that this is still a planet, although I know many of you uh, in the audience are uh, subscribers to the theory that this is just a bunch of dust from a collision that took place. But the argument against that is that it doesn't look very extended uh, like a dispersing dust cloud, although the signal to noise is too low to really tell. So where we've gotten to today in these uh, direct imaging searches, there are other examples I could show. But this is the, um, the highest performance result of direct imaging for an exoplanet companion. And this is the GPI result for 51 Eridani b, another young moving group star. Uh, and so the planet is visible here and here. You can see all these features uh, that are leftover residuals of the subtraction of the starlight. Um, so here it is at J-band, here it is at H-band. And then um, Bruce McIntosh's paper plots those spectra that they get from their data cube here. And the first thing you notice is that at shorter wavelengths, it's harder to get good adaptive optics correction, so there's bigger error bars on all the spectral um, points. And then at longer wavelengths out here in H-band, things are much more under control. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the difficulties that, that he has processing this are something I hope we're talking about at the, the meeting this week, which is that Bruce thought it was necessary to process the data with three different pipelines, different analysis methods, and see if the spectral features came out consistently between them. Um, and so in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. I mean, this, this bump over here isn't really present over there. Uh, and then there's other things that are happening within the noise level. So um, th this is something was, there's still progress to be made at. But the great thing about this detection is that it's at 10 to the minus 6 contrast after subtracting off the stellar halo. And it's at half an arc second separation. So this really defines the state of the art in high contrast imaging in the near infrared from the ground. Um, and it also shows that we want to look at longer wavelengths like um, H-band and, and longer to get our best results, at least with current AO systems. So the correlation spectroscopy method I showed you applying to um, the abundance analysis earlier on 
can also apply to uh, both the spectrum of, of transiting objects, although in this case I think they didn't need to use the transit aspect of it. This is a known radial velocity planet. And it also applies to um, uh, analyzing the dynamical state of the planet. So Snellen et al. in 2014 took um, uh, correlation spectra of Beta Pictoris b, and now they're not just looking at the fact that there's a nice bright peak here, of their uh, molecular uh, correlation. But this peak has a width that is broader than the instrumental width. And these folks interpreted it as rotational broadening of the planet. So we're actually uh, able to see the spin of this very young hot planet uh, by, through this method. Uh, and it's a 25 kilometer per second equatorial rotation rate, V sine i. Uh, was indicated at this. So this is pretty interesting that you're able to do this. The contrast is 10 to the minus 4 uh, of what they've been able to do so far. But I, I don't believe any coronagraph was used for this observation. So doing this again with a coronagraph to suppress the speckles, it might be interesting to see how much fainter we could go. So I look forward to somebody going and picking a, a dimmer target that's 10 to the 5 contrast or 10 to the 6 contrast and trying to repeat both the spin analysis on other objects and then this uh, atmospheric abundance analysis. So uh, it's a really great review paper that um, you should have a look at if you hadn't yet. Uh, Brendan Bowler, who used to be here, he's now at Texas. Uh, he has a, a paper compiling the results of many different direct imaging surveys that were done at all observatories around the world by different groups. And it's a really good state-of-the-art paper for early 2016 on what we know about these objects. There's a whole other table about planetary mass companion candidates that I didn't include here, but these are the ones that are deemed relatively confident. So here's 2 mass 1207, a planetary mass companion around a brown dwarf, and there's another one that's known here. Um, here are the, the more famous objects I just discussed, 51 Airy, 8799, all four of its planets, Beta Pictoris b. A couple others I didn't mention, but are also very interesting, like Calcium 15 seems to be an accreting protoplanet. Um, and then, uh, while these are close in, these are on much wider orbits, uh, so it's, uh, it's unclear, well, there we go, projected separation. So it's unclear whether these are formed in a disk or whether these were formed on uh, the collapse like a binary star took place. So the, the physics may be different between these two samples. So, combining together imaging, radial velocity, transit, et cetera, how do these different methods uh, enable us to constrain what we're seeing? Well, the, planets, the quantities of interest are like the, the mass and radius of the planet, what its orbit is, of course, the spectroscopy of the atmosphere, and the context for the planet. You know, can we see everything else in the system or not using these? So radio velocity uh, is doing well on the planet mass and very well on the orbit. Uh, it doesn't give us any atmospheric information, and we can only see the closer in planets that are more massive. Uh, then transit observations are, their big advantage is they give us the radius of the planet, and if it's also detectable with radial velocity, they give us the mass. There's going to be a big intersection of these two with the upcoming test mission. Unfortunately, those will all be planets we can't image. Um, and then um, uh, microlensing, uh, you know, is getting um, information on the mass somewhat, the orbit somewhat, but otherwise no on these things. And ground-based theory is doing much better on the planet radius uh, and mass than imaging of planets in reflected light, which is the higher contrast future of the field, I think. Uh, and, and so both of these are subject to seeing longer period planets. So what's the count? How well are these different methods doing? How well is imaging doing compared to everybody else? Uh, so the um, uh, results here are that astrometry, according to the NASA Exoplanet Archive, has one detection. I should have gone and looked in and figured out what that was, because I didn't think there were any. Um, but you can see imaging has only got about 40 objects, including candidates, whereas you know, radial velocity is much, much higher. And of course, transit is doing hugely well thanks to the Kepler mission. So we don't have a lot of opportunity to intersect imaging with things. The best chance is with radial velocity, but we can't really do that in, in any way right now with the contrast available to us. So now where are these planets distributed? Here's imaging, pink, off to the side up here, wide separations, larger masses, and only in very young hosts. And transit is over here, radio velocity is seeing things that are at a few AU typically. Uh, and so unfortunately, you know, again, you can see the fact that these samples don't intersect really, that imaging has got this outer um, region probed and not the inner. Okay, I've got about 15 minutes left, so I want to talk about where things are likely to head. 
So the biggest thing coming is the James Webb Telescope. It was a great thing to be at Goddard when that was being put together and go look through the clean room for once in a while to see things like this. Although this day I wasn't there, darn it. Um, <clears throat> and so the um, great thing that JWST is going to do is transit spectroscopy, which I haven't really talked about. And if you go back, say, five or ten years ago, there was excitement about the transit spectroscopy extending down to habitable Earth-sized planets. Uh, people are a little less optimistic about that now. I'll get into that. Uh, and for imaging, it's going to have trouble looking in really close, but it's going to be really sensitive to cool planets, much more than any ground-based observatory is, because up in space, without the sky background, uh, it'll be able to see widely separated companions. Unfortunately, as you'll read in Brendan's paper, the frequency of widely separated companions is low, uh, sort of 1%. It'll be hard to do lots of surveys with JWST looking for things when the frequency is that low. Um, so for transits, it's instructive to look at recent results from Hubble. This is the so-called super-Earth, it's really a Neptune, GJ1214b, and the data is shown here in black points, and basically there is no um, transit spectrum feature that is seen. It's consistent with a flat line. These compositions of, of water or of methane here uh, are clearly ruled out by the data. So it seems like transiting planets are tough when they, when they get down to be like super Earth size or mini Neptune. Ba basically what's happening is in transit you're seeing this kind of situation, this is a Cassini image of Titan, the light passing through the upper atmosphere. So that's just not as much light as you could get by reflecting off the surface <laughs> of the moon, uh, getting the full disk illumination. And models show that in transit you really uh, could have situations where you don't detect any features at all, but the exact same model in reflected light produces huge spectral features. So this is encouraging that, that um, transits are not going to clean up the field and leave nothing for direct imaging to do. Uh, and so um, th this is the, the, you know, the future is to do the, the me measurements of those features there. Um, and of course, the transit not just has that little limb to look at, but it's combined with the light of some gigantic stellar signal, uh, as shown here in the transit of Venus. So. Um, I'm confident that JWST is not going to own the spectroscopy of exoplanets, that there's lots for imaging to do. This is a simulation of transit spectroscopy with JWST around um, you know, a habitable planet uh, in an M-star host with the most favorable situation. So with 10 transits, if there's no systematic errors, they're just not really picking up the oxygen features uh, over here. Uh, and they might be picking up these CO features, though. So there's great things to be done in transit. We wish them all the success. But I think, they're, again, they're not going to put imaging out of business. Um, OK, let's look at now at the high contrast imaging missions that are coming, we hope, in the future. The first of those is going to be WFIRST. Uh, here's where we are right now with the GPI detection of uh, 51 Airy B. And here are our early, easier detections. And our solar system is so far down here in contrast, 10 to the minus 10 or so, that there's this huge gap that we have to cross. There are estimates of the EELT and the TMT performance to come, so we uh, hope to see that that performance realized, but even if it is, it's not going to get us down to Jupiter-like planets uh, in our solar system or are close to Earth's in terms of this direct imaging technique. The correlation spectroscopy technique has to uh, be figured into this, though, and its uh, limits are not known to me very well yet. All right, so w First is a dark energy mission that NASA has just started. It's going to launch in 2025 or so. It has a coronagraph added to it. It will be the first time we can fly in space away from correcting um, coronagraph with deformable mirrors. Uh, should get someplace close to 10 to the 9 contrast. Um, and it will be a technology demonstration to make sure that we're ready to do a more exciting mission in the future to do habitable zone planet imaging. Uh, if it's very lucky, it might get to super-Earths. Instead, it's just going to do known radial velocity planets. And we could talk later about the starshade option, which is being discussed, but wouldn't be acted on until the 2020 decadal survey gets to vote. So if you look now at the, um, the known RV planets and then nearby stars where their habitable zone lies, the 1AU equivalent insulation distance, you can see that the known RV planets are at contrasts here that are you know, becoming doable. They're, this is around 10 to the 9 contrast here. This is about 10 to the 8th contrast there. So this is the sample of nearby RV planets that w First is hoping to get to. Um, these are going to be um, you know, too faint down here. This is, gonna, this is a 10 to the 10 contrast uh, at that level. All right, but 10 to the 10 is what you need to go from the stellar signal in reflected light 
down to the Earth over here, or 10 to the 9 for a Jupiter. In thermal emission, it gets a little easier, but that's not an option NASA's pursuing right now. <clears throat> so to go and image these um, reflected light planets, well, what do we need to do? Um, well, first of all, if we want to look for Earths, we need a significant sample of, of stars like the Sun, where the contrast is 10 to the 10. So you're pretty much going to have to go out to at least 15 parsecs, uh, and more is better. But, of course, when you do that, the habitable zone starts to extend for a very short distance away from the star. Uh, it's uh, getting comparable to the resolution of HST. And you basically, for a coronagraph, can't look at one lambda over D with full contrast. You need to be at two or three lambda over D, so you're going to need a telescope that's two or three times the size of Hubble to do this at visible wavelengths. Then in, uh, in reflected light, you want to do this at, at, at um, half a micron where you have the best resolution uh, and um, where the, the most signal from the planet. All right, so, but the contrast, um, uh, the, the br absolute brightness, sorry, of the planets is still an issue. Here's the radial velocity planets now, not the, the delta magnitude, but just the absolute brightness at R band. Uh, and so you can see these are getting down to like 28th magnitude for the RV planets, and the Earths don't really start coming in until you get to be 29th and 30th magnitude. So we don't have spectra from Hubble of anything that's 31st magnitude or 30th magnitude. It's just um, too hard, and the efficiency of the system is too low. So it's quite a challenge to go and make a system that's going to be big enough with high enough throughput to do spectroscopy at resolution of 70, which is what we think we need to detect the Earth uh, oxygen analog signature. It's going to be really hard to do that unless you go to a quite a big telescope or look at a very small number of very bright targets. So we had an uh, effort back in the uh, beginning around 2000 and going forward that Chaz worked on heavily of uh, the terrestrial planet finder, uh, first in the infrared and then in the optical with the coronagraph. Uh, TPF was lost to history now. It wasn't able to go forward because the technology wasn't still ready and JWST needed all the money. Uh, but we're going to try uh, on a low level now to get back to that direct imaging mission that we were t thinking about 10 years ago. Uh, and that's the process of the upcoming decadal survey. Um, NASA is doing two mission studies, one called Louvoir, one called HABEX. I can describe them more fully uh, afterwards in the discussion if you like. Uh, and the idea is they would both have the goal of studying Earth light planets and reflected light. The, the difference of, between them is just how ambitious they are and maybe how much they would cost and their technical readiness. The HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet Mission, right now it's a study only, uh, would be to search for signs of habitability and biosignatures. Louvoir would want to look at a much larger sample uh, and be able to get some statistical information on the frequency of Earth analogs and different atmosphere types. Um, and so the other difference that's important is Louvoir is going to give equal priority to, to the Hubble kind of um, general astrophysics, uh, you know, extragalactic, whereas HabEx will try to do some of that, but only on a best effort basis. Uh, and these studies just started up uh, at the uh, earlier part of 2016, uh, and by the time they get to 2019, they should be done and ready to tell the decadal survey uh, what its options are, not only in terms of capability, but hopefully in terms of cost. Um, and so the, the, the kind of things that these missions have to do is they have to be able to um, distinguish planets from residual starlight, just as the ground AO observers are doing. You do that by observing at multiple wavelengths and making sure a speckle would change position and a planet would not. Or you rotate the telescope and see that the planet rotates with the sky, but the speckles don't rotate, they're fixed with a telescope. So we have these sort of techniques that will need to be applied so that the spacecraft have to have this capability. Uh, we have to be able to do proper motion observations to make sure that the object is a companion and then go back and also measure at multiple epochs what the orbit is of something we would detect uh, so that the missions all have to build this into their baseline plan. Um, and then the contrast of 10 to the uh, uh, minus 10, 25 magnitudes, is great for detecting the planet at elongation, but it might be seen partially in a crescent phase. If you want to be able to, to have some completeness in your observation, you need to be able to actually integrate deeper than that if you want to see it somewhat towards the near side. And of course, you might say, well, why don't I just observe it when it's fully illuminated like over here? But the occulting spot of the, of the coronagraph for many systems will be so large that you won't be able to see these gibbous phases. So you can't count on them being accessible in general. So then the size of the telescope, the sample you can look at, Go and look at the Hipparchos catalog, calculate your habitable zone sizes, and then their angular sizes on the sky. 
do that the same for radial velocity planets. You get these two curves here. So let's say your, your telescope can look in to 100 milli arc seconds inner working angle. If that's the case, then you can only access about 15 habitable zones. Oh, sorry, that's 30, 30 habitable zones. And then in terms of RV planets, you're getting maybe up to 40. But if you can go in closer to say 50 or you can go to 40, then now you're getting into something like 140 habitable zones uh, and maybe 100 RV planets. So you win big if you can go in close. And then again, I hope that's one of the themes of the workshop here is how do we do the best we can going really close to the inner working angle? This is the motivation for it. Um, so then another thing that um, we want to be able to do is look at uh, multiple wavelengths. I won't go through all this, but I'll just show you the next slide from the 2002 Demeray report showing the spectrum of the Earth across the optical and the near-infrared and all the various features, especially the strong water features that come in if you can go into the near-infrared. Uh, Venus has strong CO2 features. Mars, with hardly any atmosphere, doesn't have strong features, but you can see a little bit of the CO coming in there. So the, the main point of this is that both HabEx and Louvoir need to consider a near-infrared capability for as many targets as they might be able to access. Otherwise, we're just not going to know, for example, if there's a large CO2 atmosphere. But I want to impress upon you that this is a hard problem. So let's say you take uh, telescopes of different sizes, 4, 8, and 12 meters. It turns out for the number of um, targets you can access here, you have these signal levels. And then if you get a bigger telescope, you can access more targets. But the average signal level of those fainter targets is still about the same. We're, we're getting, even with these large apertures, you know, one photon a minute from an exo-Earth planet. And then they've got these other backgrounds around here, the sky background in the solar system, possible dust in the exoplanetary system, residual starlight. Uh, so all these things contribute to make the problem difficult. And the, and the, the Zodi and the other system, the dust particles there and the scattered light they produce is still not well constrained. Um, and so that's the faint signals. And this is just from inner working angle considerations, how many of these you can do. Um, and even if you can access a planet, it doesn't mean you can see the spectrum over all the wavelengths. Typically, the inner working angle is getting bigger as you go to longer wavelengths, and so it's cutting off parts of the spectrum that you'd like to see. So an eight-meter telescope would access you know, about 80 uh, habitable zone targets, uh, but the, only about half of them would have full spectral capability. Uh, you can see the integration times here, too. Multiply all these numbers by whatever you think eta sub Earth is to get the actual yield that the mission might have. Um, and so one of the last things I'll mention, a capability we'd like to have for these future direct imaging missions, is to look at variability in the planet's signal. And in reflected light, it was observed by the um, epoxy mission back in um, 2009, the, the, the repurposed deep impact spacecraft, looking back at the Earth and watching it rotate, that features on the surface of the Earth modulated the total integrated brightness by about 20 or 30 percent. So um, if you want to be able to measure that uh, sort of in two hours, uh, seeing you know, continents rotate under view, uh, for example, or oceans, then the number of, of targets where you can do that photometrically is shown here. It's relatively small, multiply by eta sub Earth. Um, and then if you want to take spectral photometry of these at the same time, it's even smaller. So uh, you, um, while these are great things to talk about, we have all love to know the rotation rate of the planets in the other solar system. Uh, it's not going to be doable on a large fraction of their um, available targets. And you could talk about looking around the year as the planet orbits and seeing seasonal variations. You know, the Martian ice caps become very prominent reflectors at some times of the year and other times of the year they're not. So that's something you might hope to see in an exoplanet. So to wind up, um, imaging is going to tell us, unlike the other techniques, it's sort of in one quick deep image, it could show us the planets that are there and the dust structures and their spatial relationship to each other. It tells us all these things about the atmospheric composition. And if you have a very transparent ap atmosphere, maybe the surfaces too, and maybe the time variable phenomena I just mentioned. So JWST's major contribution coming up is going to be a transit spectroscopy, but there will be imaging. Uh, then W first in 2025 on a small sample of uh, known radio velocity planets. And the ground telescopes like TMT are hopefully going to get big instruments for adaptive optics uh, and contribute at the end of the 2020s. Uh, we hope to get to 10 to the minus 8 contrast from the ground, but 10 to the minus 10 still looks like it's the domain of space telescopes above the atmosphere. And the last thing I wanted to say is that um, over 400 years, 
We've gone from imaging a multiple planetary system, kind of, Galileo with his little telescope, uh, and see something that to me is very reminiscent. Instead of the edge-on kind of orbit of the Galilean moons, we've got the face-on orbit of the HR 8799 planets. But um, think about all that's happened in the 400 years since this observation was made, and, and think about all that can happen in the next 400 years since this observation was made. Maybe we'll go there, or, or maybe we'll just be um, making the biggest telescopes that we couldn't imagine now. Uh, and that's what I had to say. Thanks.